going everyone um new book review francis fukuyama our post-human future biotechnology um this book is actually pretty good i'd recommend it um pretty it was written in 2002 so 20 year period i think a 20 year period to see how a, a book which is discussing future events is a pretty good uh time frame to actually have to see how it how it uh how it relates to the current situation and so on um i'm just gonna try actually go into a, a slideshow okay all right so basically um this is the main this is the first half of the book i'm, I'm gonna do this in two parts first half of the book concerns itself mainly with natural rights so we're going away from as we'll talk about we're going away from um human rights to natural rights so the distinction will be should be clear by the end of this video but um um so why do we need a philosophy of human nature as in a philosophy of basically if we're going to posit rights as being natural and not human um why do we need to go towards the natural lens which is a lens which he points out i think ended he, i think he observes that it ends with hume it goes all the way from plato to hume and then after that you kind of have kant and then you have a post kantian um alternative which doesn't which doesn't base itself around a kind of philosophy of human nature and, and um an essence and so on so so basically the kind of the kinds of technologies that he's discussing are biomedical technologies so we're talking genetic engineering cloning um genetic enhancement so the ability to you know go into your you know genetic makeup before you're born even while you're in in utero and uh you know tweak things play around with things to make you better looking smarter or uh, live longer or whatever so um you have there's a few different topics he talks about in the first section of the book which is the prolongation of life um genetic enhancement and the general kind of pharmacological um uh interventions into human behavior and human biology um which are not just merely the point he's trying to make out is that they're not merely just there for therapeutic use they're there for the, the therapeutic uh, treatment of diseases kind of blurs into the political realm of social competition, social control, power, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, why we need a philosophy of human nature? Well, he thinks this is this is important in order to set boundaries on where we can and cannot use these technologies what we should and should not use these technologies for these technologies force us in a sense to actually philosophize about what is human nature and where are the limits of technological intervention into that nature or where are they just pointless where are we going to try change human nature on a kind of technical level and it's just impossible because it's almost like ontologically just fixed it's eternal it's not quite uh it's not quite possible all you're, all you're going to do is cause much more problems than you are going to fix by trying to do it um so it, it's based around an, an ontological concern which is which is not uh which kind of goes against the economistic and utilitarian um you know uh a kind of dogmas that we've inherited so this quote from his uh while it's legitimate to worry about the unintended consequences and unforeseen costs the deepest fear that people express about technology is not a utilitarian one at all it is rather a fear that in the end biotechnology will cause us in some way to lose our humanity that is some essential quality that has always underpinned our sense of who we are and where we are going despite all the evident changes that have taken place in the human condition throughout the course of history worse yet we might make this change without even recognizing that we had lost something of great value we may thus emerge on the other side of a great divide between human and post-human history and not even see the watershed had been breached because we lost sight of what that essence is so 
um, you kind of have this uh, 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 almost like it reminds me of a little bit of Zizek. We'll get into that later. Uh, post idea, of post ideology. We're not even aware we're being ideological because we've lost any idea of what ideology actually is anymore. Kind of the same thing for this. It's like we're not even aware of. Uh, this massive ontological change in how we actually view what is human and what is not human. And you see this with like transhumanist movements. And he talks about this, actually. He talks about the... Um, he talks about... Uh, one interesting thing he says is, uh, is about um, pharma, ph the pharmaceutical use of uh, Ritalin. I think this is more, more of an American thing. I don't think it's, Ritalin is that popular in Europe. But um, the Ritalin on young boys who can't, who won't sit still in classrooms, which is obviously a very interesting topic today since we've had a few years of e-learning and masking children and so on. So young boys who won't sit still in classrooms, we've used Ritalin to uh, try like, you know, medicate them to sit them still and so on. Um, and he points out this is kind of just, this just, this just goes against the natural behavior of young boys. On the other hand of that, you have, kind of middle-aged women who are all Prozac'd up to the eyeballs. And what Prozac does is it increases the, ser the serotonin levels in your brain, which is typically associated with, from a kind of a biological standpoint, with a kind of assertive masculinity. Like if you look at chimpanzees, he points this out in one chapter in the book, if you look at chimpanzees, chimpanzees, the alpha male, of the chimpanzee tribe or the challenger to the alpha male they always have this kind of over uh they have this like heightened serotonin levels in their brain i pretty sure jordan peterson talks about this and this whole like social hierarchy thingy but um uh the the point is basically that we're um using these technologies to androgenize people so young boys are becoming are less allowed to be on boys to have that kind of excess of energy they're being kind of drugged to calm down middle-aged women are being drugged perhaps to perform better in a kind of corporate workplace and so on right so um you have all these interesting uh actual kind of there's, there's a certain logic to the use of these drugs and to the use of this so that's another kind of danger that he sees um and it Interestingly, he points out about, okay, we'll get into that in a minute, so I'll leave that for now. But, um, so what's wrong with human rights, basically? Why, why is human rights a kind of a failure in, uh, in dealing with these issues? Well, um, human rights don't correspond to a kind of consistent view of human nature, which can set boundaries on where these technologies are trespassing. Um, human rights are basically a kind of humanist, rational, utilitarian um expression of needs so you'll often see if like people say people today kind of use rights very abstractly and they'll say like i have a right to i don't know that and they'll point out something which is a complete consumer entitlement like it's not like based on like freedom or an essential in, in an essential sense or um sovereignty or um you know, uh, the right to reproduce or something like that. It's not kind of based on anything essential or eternal. It's like something that's only been around. It's some kind of consumer entitlement that's only been around in the past, I don't know, like um, a few decades, and this suddenly becomes a right. So he sees rights as basically these kind of like ra these kind of utilitarian needs, which um, are very contingent, very inconsistent, and they don't really, like, they're, they're only going to end up becoming an exas like justifying these technologies. Because, of course, the way he sees the, um, this could be in the next part, here we are, yeah. The way he sees the threat of this technology being used isn't, as Hollywood often tells us, um, this kind of uh, dystopian intrusion into liberal democracy, as in like, you know, you have a, like a fascistic or Stalinistic kind of overlord who, you know, controls everyone through uh, biotechnologies, but rather that, the, the manner in which he thinks the, the, the danger is going to come is going to be basically like these technologies are going to be liberalized on the market. And the, for example, parents, basically through kind of bougie social competition, parents will be like, I want to enhance my kid to be more intelligent or I want to enhance my kid to be, uh, you know, taller. I want to enhance my kid, like things that will, things that are perceived to get that person better 
you know make their life easier to kind of move through a kind of social hierarchy and social mobility um and this is the kind of way in which the technologies are going to be kind of commodified um so what's interesting about it is that you don't have this um well as what i like about fukuyama even if i don't agree with the whole kind of like liberal democracy being the end of history what i like about fukuyama is that he doesn't do what like you know so-called radicals would do which is like let's ignore all the critique and dangers of liberalism and democracy itself and let's pretend like there's this fascistic intrusion into the system which is coming from an external force whether it's like oh russians or like you know trump or whatever um so basically what you know what they would probably do would say something like the system is a threat from this external intrusion um and that's the threat and they're going to use these technologies in a bad way and he's saying no actually even if we agree liberal democracy is the end of history and so on there is still this danger within it this kind of liberal individualistic kind of bougie social competition and that's the way these technologies are going to be used and that's the risk and i think that's completely true like i think that is the risk um so you also have this kind of like nietzschean moment and i mean the book is interesting because it has each i would say like each each section has a has a quote which is um um you know, like a kind of quote from a book just to, to like to start out the next chapter. And most of them are from Nietzsche. Most of them are from Nietzsche's Zarathustra or um, I think it's Twilight of the Idols. I'm not sure, but most of them are from Nietzsche. So you kind of have this like Nietzschean God is dead theme in that when, when God dies and we kind of lose any sense of direction, you do have this enhancement like the Ubermensch, but it's a kind of bougie consumer enhancement. It's not this great, overcoming of like the next you know the uh, overcoming of this position of a last man and so on it's it's this kind of like very last man orientated consumer enhancement so even within liberalism itself which is supposed to kind of negate from these extremities and these polarities you kind of have this uh th th this threat um so this is actually a really interesting section where he talks about the naturalistic fallacy he's is 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 cope as i wrote like just for a joke but it's it's um the naturalistic fallacy is a fallacy itself right so he goes against his naturalistic fallacy and he says quote i believe that this broad turn away from human nature based theories of right is flawed for a number of reasons perhaps the most revealing weakness of deontological theories of right is that virtually all philosophers who attempt to lay out such a scheme end up reinserting various assumptions about human nature into their theories. The only difference is that they do it covertly and dishonestly rather than explicitly, as in the earlier tradition from Plato to Hume. So he attacks two, two people in particular, Kant and John Rawls. Um, Post-Kantian philosophy posits a view of human nature as essentially rational or, or in development of a rational human subject. And the and Fukuyama argues that this is a, a claim towards human nature, that we are naturally inclined in that direction. This isn't um it, it just it just doesn't put, do it up front. It just doesn't claim that's what it's doing, but that's what it's doing. Even more inter interestingly, Rawls, um who is often credited, I think, as being kind of one of the main uh founders of like human rights as opposed to like natural rights um Rawls on the other hand assumes that our nature is risk averse so you know his whole um what's it called uh the blind thing where you you look at the world through a non-identity non-particular lens and then you go from there because the argument is that we would never like it's kind of averting our own risk of ending up on a kind of bottom of a social hier hierarchy if we have this kind of like completely de-particularized uh, view of, of egalitarian rights. Um, but that assumes that we're risk averse. That's, that's, that assumes that we wouldn't want to take that risk in order to get on top, you know, that we're all kind of in the middle. Um, and I think that there's a few things actually, which is pointed out recently that this is not true. If you take like, one of the examples I was thinking of here is, uh, um the destruction of unions and the kind of gamification of the economy like zero hour contracts and so on this is sold to us as like 
yeah, it's less secure, as in like it's it's more risk averse, but it also may get you more, it, it, it may improve your life in this kind of strange, deeply ideological sense. Um, and these technologies actually have, I mean, these this uh, this political economy has taken over. So, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean we're all risk averse. Um, gamification is the same. I was talking to someone recently who was saying that they think wokeness was this like misplaced altruism, like because there was a report done where they showed younger people were more likely to be okay with cancel culture as opposed to older people. And it was like, oh, this is like young people are just so moralistically good and altruistic, and oh my god, uh, this is this is a misplaced altruism. Um, and I was like, no, it's because it's it, they gamified the entire social system. Like everyone's so ruthlessly in, in competition with each other since these uh, social media technologies have come in that I don't care if I if the guy in my workplace is being cancelled or fired or someone's being socially excluded based on complete lies because I think I can because it's a game and you can it's a the cancellation is a game and you can kind of um what's the word you can kind of you I even tell myself I'll accept the corrupt game because I think I can use the game to my advantage in the long run and I can get on top it's a game so yeah the whole risk averse thing is is, is nonsense but anyway the point is this is a bit of a tangent but the point is that the naturalist the naturalistic fallacy is uh, a fallacy itself, according to Fukuyama, and I think there's some, there is some uh, truth to that. Um, so what now? Um, well, so biotechnology. Basically, what I think this book is very much about, like, what is biotechnology going to do philosophically to us? What's it going to um, force us to have to confront? Um. It threatens many assumptions about human beliefs, social systems, and behaviors by providing scientific answers to social problems and thus posts scientific solutions to social problems. For example, IQ distribution or emotional regulation through pharmacology. Um, if we can say, you know, it like, and he kind of warns against like the politically correct use of these technologies. So one threat that might be is this. There is, there is, because he, he also argues that, I, I don't really know much about the, the IQ g uh, genetic discussion. I know it gets racialized and I know it gets, it gets into some dodgy territories, but there is, according to him, some um, uh, truth to, you know, genetic, genetic inheritance of, as opposed to environmental um, crea creation of, uh, or inheritance of, intelligence there's he says it's something like 40 60 or 50 50 like 60 environmental 40 40 um um uh, genes which is still significant right it's significant enough if we i don't know if that's true or not but let's say it's 50 50 or 60 or even say it's like 80 20 or 70 30 right it's enough to kind of justify a kind of a egalitarian like well hold on a minute we should uh go into the brains of babies and make them more smart because that's fair they're going to turn out to be more equal and so on so you have this kind of it's funny because um it shows you how deeply bougie a lot of our um so-called radical egalitarians are today because one of the one, one of the main premises of the kind of liberal bourgeois enlightenment was that like economistic thinking is like man is driven towards bettering his conditions this is our kind of economistic drive we better our conditions so you can kind of see as like you know biology becomes one of those conditions like well you know i'm, I'm going to be uh less you know successful in in the kind of a uh, uh, rat race towards middle or up, upper middle management in the corporate workplace so i better uh, i better genetically enhance my children so they can be better pmcs or whatever um <laughs> so like that's kind of the that's kind of uh, where we're at basically with where he's coming from from his positing this danger and of course this could be a, pl a politically correct thing because this is, i mean it is an egalitarian argument to say you know um my baby is going to be disadvantaged because look the, the the neurologist in the hospital told her told me that he has a lower iq or he has genetic codes which predetermine him towards a lower iq or whatever um the other aspect of this is that it also forces us to rethink human ontology and uh views of human nature for example like 
how are we how, the point the point he's making is how are we going to think and regulate these technologies in a way which they don't get out of hand and get you know abused and misused and so on is that we need to start philosophizing about human nature or essences and so on um um one of the, one example he brings up is the you know christian belief that we're we're created in the image of god therefore it provides a kind of grounding against for protecting the body against scientific manipulation so um if we're created in the image of god it goes against the kind of the laws of nature um divine laws and so on to intervene in that the body is kind of protected under that ontological reflection of divinity we are a reflection of divinity in our body so um it is and that's not really just christian you could you could even see that's kind of a pagan thing as well if you look at ancient greece the the human form being divine and beauty and so on so these are the kinds of things which are going to maybe have to be rethought and like reinterpreted and so on and again you have a kind of god is dead theme because you know it isn't the kind of in, in the post god is dead world where these where we do you do have this possibility towards this scientific enhancement um so okay so that's the end of this video but the next video will be on uh f human dignity so he thinks the human dignity is basically the grounding for this a kind of secular grounding for regulating um the use of these technologies and so on so i'll make that video soon but uh yeah well if you like this kind of stuff just uh, subscribe and all that thanks